Your support of the Candid Frame over the past 12 years has been invaluable to us. You have not only helped us produce over 400 episodes, but your donations directly helped us to create the Candid Frame app and making it available for free. We are now proud to announce the release of a new way for you to listen to TCF. We have released a new skill that is compatible with Amazon Alexa-enabled devices. Using voice commands, you can listen to the latest episodes, jump forward and back, and if you stop listening partway through an episode, it will remember where you left off. And like the Candid Frame app, it's free for users in the U.S. and Canada. In the coming months, the skill will be available in other countries. And I'll let you know when those become available. You can help and continue to support the work that we do here by contributing as little as $2 a month to our Patreon campaign. You not only help us to meet our cost of production, but provide us the means to improve the quality of the show and do so much more. Contribute today by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. This is Ibadi and X, and this is The Candid Frame. The Candid Frame has offered me a wonderful opportunity to talk with some amazing photographers, many of whom have been my photographic heroes. Though you might not have heard it in my voice, I could be both excited and incredibly nervous in talking with some of these people whose work has inspired and educated me as a photographer. Joe Meyerowitz is one of those photographers, and I so appreciate how quickly he put me at ease the very first time I sat down and talked to him for the show. He has an infectious enthusiasm for photography that you hear in his voice and which you certainly see in his photographs. And I always come away from our talks with a renewed love for this thing that we share. My third sit down with Joe coincides with the release of his latest book, Where I Find Myself his single-volume retrospective of his lengthy career. He's also the first photographer to offer his photographic wisdom in the Masters of Photography online workshop series, both of which I highly recommend. This is a longer-than-usual episode of TCF, but I hope that you enjoy every minute of it. And, you know, learning a new language in your know, later years makes your brain work in very different ways. And I, I truly find myself rejuvenated. I feel so energetic and playful and my work has changed. So, so all in all, the last four years living here in Italy has been a totally open-minded, open-ended experience for me. And I, I, you know, I don't seem to miss New York. After 75 years of living there, you would think it would be, you know, the, the, the grit is in my blood, but I truly don't find myself missing it. I, I'm, I have to say I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I often you get back there because uh, from what I hear, you still have your studio uh, back in New York. Yes, well, my archive is there, and my gallery is in New York, and, and you know, I've got thousands and thousands of prints in the studio, and I have my, I have a, a curator who's been with me for a few years, uh, who runs the studio. So I go back maybe once a year for a couple of weeks to see family and catch up on some things in the city, but... You know, it's not, uh, it, given our, look, you and I are speaking now, quasi face-to-face, but I don't feel the, you know, I need to be in the city. I have a big printer here. I've got, you know, um, all kinds of museum curators and collectors and dealers who come to visit. So I feel like the world and my place in it are fluid in the contemporary sense. And I don't have to be fixed in one place like I used to think I had to be. Had you been thinking about moving for a while? No, it was one of those life, interesting life moments. My wife, Maggie, who's English and has lived 40 years in America or more, you know, was living with with me in New York for the last 28 years. And and a few years ago, I said, you know, I I knew that she wasn't loving New York. She's um, a rather spiritual person, and the city didn't write, really appeal to her. She's a writer also. And, and I said, you know, you've lived on my agenda 
for the last 25 years, more or less. How about if you become the captain of the ship <laughs> and, and you tell me where you want to go with it and I'll be the first mate. And she said, let's, let's move back to Europe. You've said, ever since I've known you, you've said, I'd love to live in Europe again like I did in 66 and 67. It was such a freeing time for me. She said, why don't you, you've been saying it, why don't we do that and just spend a year? And after a year, you'll know if you want to stay or go or, you know, what you want to do. And that's how it happened. And after the year was up, and I didn't go back to New York during that year, after the year was up, I, I felt like, gosh, every day was so interesting. I'll just take another day. And at the end of every day, we'll see what the next day brings. And now it's four years on a day-to-day basis. <laughs> <laughs> what surprised you most about making making that choice? Well, I guess the surprise really is that my mindset prior to le- leaving New York was that this was a necessity for me. I needed to be in New York. My work was there. My family was there. The street was there. My connections were there. And and you know when you have all those links that you feel you must maintain, it's hard to, to break that. But by stepping away and, and allowing myself to be in free fall, now free fall, I think, is a very important stage of life. And it happens to all of us whenever we let it. We make a change of career or a change of a direction of work. And I've done that six or seven times in my life. And so entering this free fall, which is to be away from my supposed need of being in New York, has allowed me during the fall to look at all kinds of different things. And I find I'm making new work. I find my, and this is the strangest thing, Baronex, my career, my late career and I never thought of having a career, you know, just a, I'm just a guy who makes photographs. But in Europe, I am taken very seriously, and I have been since the 70s. And so I just have one museum show after another and one gallery show and books. I've put out more books in the last couple of years than I've done at any time in my life. So in, in a way, this this stepping out of my familiar way of being has opened up a kind of vista. And I think everybody needs that and at some point in their life, a kind of freshening of the air we breathe and the creative ways we go about our work and, and what we think of as our work. And so I, I really offer this to all of your listeners, you know, when when you feel like you're on a treadmill or you're in place or you're not refreshing yourself enough, it's time to let yourself go into free fall, how, whatever that is for you, and watch what goes by and see what, you know, what the, fra- the fragrance is that you catch or the image that appears or the experience and welcome it. Because it's just the next thing. It doesn't have to be permanent. It's just the next thing. And the surprise that comes with it may be just the surprise one needs to a new fit life. You know, that's, it's really interesting you, you say that because I've, I was thinking about the story that, that you know, that launched your, your career, that opportunity to see Robert Frank at work. And then you're seeing him at work and being inspired by that and then going into your boss's office and saying, you know, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to become a photographer. You didn't even own a camera. You know, you probably hadn't taken many <laughs> pictures at, at all. And th- th- that's like a perfect example of what you're talking about, about going into free fall. And you've told the story before, but one of the things I really wanted to go a little further with that is what allowed you in that moment to go with that decision. Because I think a lot of people have that moment of epiphany and despite how excited they may be, they, they can't see it through. And I'm wondering, what do you think it was about you in that moment that allowed you to 
It's, that's really that's really a very thoughtful question, it, it, and 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 really, when people counter their impulse, it's like you know, it's like stabbing yourself. It's it's like stopping breathing. It's like stopping the middle of the most exciting moment that you're in right now, like love or something. It's like canceling it out and saying, "I don't deserve this." When that moment happened for me, when I saw Robert Frank just moving, gliding in front of these two girls, and I was hearing the click of the camera and looking over his shoulder and seeing the moment in the click, the moment had reached a little apogee, you know, as if it had just become crystallized in front of me. And, and you know, it was it was photographs being made, but what I experienced was movement and timing. And possibly movement and timing entered me, not as an idea, as much as a desire. I was like, oh, I could be in the world moving through the world and with a camera in my hand and those Things that I pass through, moments of time that I pass through, would become clear to me. It was as understood in that brief moment. My identity was out there in front of me, waiting to be discovered. Because I was 24 years old. I didn't really have an identity. I mean, we're all... I think continuously in search of the thing that is central to our understanding of ourselves, because art comes from that. I mean, it's an amalgam of knowing yourself and yet being free enough to add yet another frame, another aspect, another tangent to the way you're moving through your life and you're understanding yourself. So I think that it took my breath away, the, the, the sheer understanding that this was a possibility and it was as if a key had been put into a door and the door opened and there was nothing to be afraid of. In front of me, there seemed to be a meadow filled with sunlight and grasses blowing and flowers waving and welcoming. And I just stepped through that doorway into my life. And there was no reason to look back or resist. And I truly believe that that first step I made was what gave me the sense that life could be like that. Mm-hmm. And that every time something comes to me and I say yes to it, I enter the next unfolding of being and you know it's you one can take the stance in life of resistance or acceptance that's all all there is there's no middle ground i mean for living to me there's no middle ground you either resist and say no i don't want i I can't do that or you say yeah I'll, i'll do that so you have a choice and if you keep on choosing resistance well what does that mean yeah. That's a no. Basically, that's a no. And I feel that life is a yes. Photography, as I said this to you before, that every time I press the button on the camera, it's a yes. So welcoming life. You know, we're here. We're here now. This is it. We're living in the now. What are, you, what are we waiting for? I feel like photography has shown me that even at a thousandth of a second, some fresh and yet fragmentary revelation is possible. We creatures are so extraordinarily sensitive. We've lived millennia, we've developed for millions of years into this kind of species where our our brain and our instincts and our intuition and our senses have allowed us to survive as the most sentient creature on the planet. And we can use these assets that nature has developed in us to sense out and recognize and identify fragmentary moments that appear in front of us. 
All we have to do is acknowledge them and say yes to them. And photography is a yes medium. At, at least, you know, I don't know if anybody else believes this, but I, I have witnessed that for the last 55 years, and it's given me a wonderful joy ride. Now, when I, when I hear you say that, you know, what, what I get from it is this idea is that photography became the means by which you experienced something so true to life that whatever resistance that the world may have presented or you may have created for yourself was sort of supplanted, sort of cast aside because you had experienced something that felt so true and so honest and so alive in that moment that it seemed, didn't seem like there was anything that could stand in the way of you being able to pick up the camera and recreate that for yourself over and over again. You, Would that be a fair way of describing it? Marian, it's even better than fair. It, we, we understand each other. I think we've always had a wonderful sympathy and harmony with each other, which is what one of the, the pleasures for me of, of speaking with you. Because that's it, you know, the, the, the die was cast at that moment that photography penetrated my young life and I saw the revelation of it. It's like a spiritual thing in a way, you know, it's not, it's not God, <laughs> it's, but it's, it was a way for me to experience constant and continuing joy. When, the other night at my 80th birthday party, at, at some point I had to get up and I, I really wanted to and say thank you to all my friends who traveled to Berlin from New York and other places to be with me on that night. And, and I said that really I, I am so fortunate a person that I had that encounter with Robert Frank because I've lived the last 55 years basically saying like a shock of surprise. Everywhere I go, things look remarkable to me. And I just reach for the camera, which is always in my hand or on my shoulder. It's cocked and ready and on. And I just reach and I, I say yes to these things. And then later on, I can um, retrieve them and look at them and see what was it in the course of this day or that day or this moment or who I was with that was so stunning to me that I, I welcomed it in. And that's, it's been a positive, ongoing experience. And I know even in some cases, like, let's say, ground zero, you, it's difficult to say, oh, it was a positive experience. Well, sure, you know, the tragedy happened. And then when that happened, everything after that was digging itself out of that. And there were wonders and joys and visual pleasures and experiences. Positive things happened afterwards because time and nature offers that to us and, and so even in the in the depths of ground zero and the rubble and destruction of it there were positive and beautiful things that i witnessed and experiences with other human beings in which we were in harmony with our sentiments and our, our emotions and so it's to be found everywhere and and i i can I can think of no better life to have had in the last 55 years than the one that I've experienced in which so many moments of extraordinary meaning have come out of, out of just the next breath, yeah. basically. Well, your latest book is Where I Find Myself, which is a, a single volume retrospective of your work, which is actually the second retrospective because you did a two volume retrospective some years back. It's this is an interesting book because it occurs in reverse chronological order. So you're showing your most recent work and then going back in time, showing the work that you you know produced earlier. And I was really curious as to why you decided to order the book in that particular way. It's I, I think it's a kind of interesting uh, um, point of view because retrospect means in retrospect we're looking backwards through time and and the convention is to look backwards and start at the beginning and come up to today and i thought to myself well that's a convention but why do we have to do that this is where i find myself now in fact i chose the title 
because I realized that photography has been the agent of me discovering myself. And I should own that in some way. And, and I have found myself in so many odd places in the course of my life, odd moments, odd events, you know, unexpected things. And, and I have had my own self-discovery through photography. So it seemed to me that as an innocent title, where I find myself actually has a kind of double entendre in the sense that I found myself through photography and wherever I am, I find myself through the, through the camera. And here I am living in Italy and what the hell am I doing making still lifes? The last thing I ever thought I would make is a still life. I'm, I'm a street photographer and I like timing and light and nature and the unexpected. And I always assumed still lifes were you know, people putting things on a tabletop and moving them around for some idealized beauty, beautiful objects or beautiful positions and relationships. They, they have a kind of history in, the, in painting, beautiful objects, beautifully rendered with the light and the way the tablecloth hangs off the edge and the knife sticks over the edge so it looks like it's pushing out into the three dimensions and all kinds of illusions and, and metaphors. And here I am working with basically discarded old objects that have had their use and they've been thrown away, they're cast-offs. And for some, and I've never been a collector of anything. I have too many photographs. They take up too much space. So uh, making collections of objects was something I never did. But in recent years, it, it somehow happened. And the objects that I collected seem to have a very odd quality of life. And I found myself putting them on a little, like a little theatrical space and seeing if I could assemble them in ways in in a way that related to what I observed on the street about mass and power and movement and unexpected associations of scale and light. And, and so that raised itself as yet another question, because, you know, as we've talked before, I mean, you know, to go from a street photographer to the large format camera and to do landscapes and then portraits and then panoramas and then you know, ground zero and pictures at dusk. Things about photography have constantly suggested themselves to me as another part of photography to consider. Like, well, you know, what is a portrait? Who is it of? Um, how do you go about making it? So, so here I am asking in the, in the same sense, a question about what is a still life? What is it about? What do these objects mean? And how do they relate? And, and, and it forced me to reconsider a lot of still lifes that have been made historically, like Edward Weston's pepper or, you know, the seashells. You know, when a new question comes, photography gets more interesting all of a sudden. And I like that. I, th I think the medium is inexhaustible, how many different things one can ask of it. Let's go a little further with, with, with the still lifes, because I really find it fascinating, because I completely get a part of what you were saying. Because on the street, you would look at all these disparate elements that were sort of playing out on the stage, and you would be very conscious of their placement within the composition and how important separation and space and how they would sort of vibe off of each other. But you had no control over any of that except of how you framed it. But now with the still life, you're still having pretty much the same sensibility, but now you're in control of the placement of those different objects in relationship to each other. And was it a bit of a challenge having that control rather than just allowing ser serendipity to play itself out in terms of the relationship to yeah, each other? It was. Well, you know, I mean, let's just jump backwards for a moment onto the street. Because even though the street is flowing like a stream with all kinds of creatures in it, 
the photographer also is moving on the street and using a kind of extrasensory radar. As you look at the street, you see people moving on the street and you think, oh, oh, that couple over there and this guy over here and the messenger on the bike. And you're watching the movement and you, you thrust your body forward or laterally so that you could put yourself into a future contact and relationship with those forms as they come to you. You don't know what's going to happen. And the background is changing, right? The street background, cars on the, in, in, you know, on the street itself and people on the sidewalk and the buildings. Behind. So you're actually, through your own movement, changing the pulse of all the elements of the street. So even though it's out of control, you are the engine of motivation. You put yourself in relation to things. So working with still life objects, I, let's say I have really, and I do have 60 or 70 objects hanging around the studio all the time. And you know, at first I started with just one object and I tried to make a portrait of it and I would sit with the object and turn it around on the tabletop and just look at it to see if one facet of it as I turned it, if one side of it dented or dinged or colored or rusted or whatever was speaking to me more than the other side. Because objects are, you know, for the most part, machine made. Sometimes they're handmade and they have a uniformity to them. But when they've lived and been thrown away, they get beat up and they're like old characters you come across for a portrait. So at first, I just tried to make portraits of these objects. And in fact, I used Cezanne's objects and Morandi's objects, two painters whose studios I had visited. And I had seen that they had collected objects which they used for form, basically, rectangles or boxes or cylinders or circles. And I just, I just used that. And after a while, I began to assemble my own characters. And I decided to put them in a little teatrino, a little theater, and watch the way they interacted. And then I could play with them. I could just sit, sit with them and move them around and get closer or further away, cluster them in one way, separate them in another way, knock them over. And it became like a, a discovery. You know, I felt like I wasn't in control, that as I sat with the objects, intuition, just like on the street, different because it's on a tabletop, but just like on the street, some little signal would come about, well, you know, those three should just be a little closer together. Something happens when they're closer together. And I could move them closer or further, and I could watch what happens. And, you know, I, I have to be absolutely honest with you. I think your listeners might enjoy this. It was the first summer I was here in Tuscany, and it was 100 degrees every day in Tuscany. Tuscany is a very hot, it's, it's like the furnace valley mm. of Italy. It was so hot every day for three months that in the middle of the day you could not go outside because it was just like exhausting. The heat would blister. There was not one day of rain in three months. And, and uh, that was like 2012. And I was forced into the house during the day. And there was a tiny little upstairs loft in what this, this is an old barn we're living in. We don't own it. It's just a rental. And in the upstairs of the barn was this hay loft. And that's where I had a little studio. And in that, really, all I was wearing was my shorts and, and sweating. But it was cooler than outside because it had a thick roof to it. And so I could... I, fo I was forced to work inside, and that's when these still started happening. So in a way, the, <laughs> the place I was in forced me to change my way of being <laughs> and make these still lives. So I had a few hours in the day to play in a totally different, it's the free fall moment again. And so there you go. I mean, sometimes it's as simple as that. You go somewhere and a different, uh, a different tempo occurs and you're changed, irrevocably changed. What, what format are you using to produce these photographs and why? 
I am using the Leica S camera, and I will be absolutely honest with you. I, I borrowed the S from Leica in New York a number of years uh, before when they first came out with it. And I made some tests because I was going off to do a big project to do a book on Provence. And I wanted to see if there was an alternative to the 8x10. So I used the S and I made a few prints and I blew them up to 60 inches. And I put them on the wall next to a 60-inch print from my 8x10 view camera. And I literally cut the edges so that I butted the two edges together, the 8x10 at 60 inches and the, and the Leica S format. And then I took a, a loop and I studied the grain structure and the tonal qualities and the color qualities. And as I slipped back and forth from one to the other, I saw no difference. Sharpness, <coughs> no pixels, a very long tonal curve, deep information in the shadows, detail in the highlights. I was so astonished by the quality of it that I thought, you know, why resist? This camera has come finally to the standards that I live by. And I'm going to use this to do the book on Provence. And I did the book. And at some point, I had an exhibition in the south of France. And then later, it went to um, the museum in Paris, the uh, Museum de Europe, MEP in Paris, and has since traveled all over Europe. And in it, I had some prints that were up to eight feet tall, made from this camera, and they're exquisite. So we're in the digital age, and we've been, we've been in it really since 2000. It's when I start, first started really making pictures with a digital camera. It wasn't a very good camera. It was a, you know, it was an Olympus camera. It made a file of only a couple of megabytes, but... It, at an 8x10, it was a nice print. And, and bit by bit, they've gotten better and better and better and better. And now you can make an 8-foot tall print. And it's exquisite. So that's what I use here. And, you know, I've been, I was probably the first Photoshop photographer in like 91 or 92. I learned Photoshop by myself, no book. And I gave them a lot of feedback about what they needed for the dark room and all that. So I've been doing this for a long time. I have my own printer here and my own Photoshop and I got a couple of monitors and I can do my own dumb work right here in Tuscany. So I feel completely connected. I print regularly. I feel like uh, I'm self-contained. I don't have to have chemistry and trays and a dark room. What a liberation that is. Do you prefer to have control over how you process your images? Because I know other photographers will allow an assistant to process the image with their feedback, obviously. But do you prefer to, to have your hands in it? Yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, I have had many assistants who worked with me in the studio who I taught how to print and how to work with my negatives and my values. And basically, in a way, instructing them on how to uh, replicate my sensibility and and they've gone on to be significant photographers in their own right now with their own voice and their own eye and their own style but i feel like i was very helpful in giving them a set of values you know that started with my understanding of what color values were from working with eight by 10 negatives and the like and Kodachrome for all those years, you know, I had an understanding of it, but I, I process my own images. I, I, the language of Photoshop is second nature to me. I'm, I don't have to do a lot of heavy work on it. I can come to finish in less than 10 moves. Most of the time, I don't have to have 20 layers. I can really do it in, two or three layers. It's, it's a skill that I've developed, you know, carefully and for 
years. Like I say, since nine, probably since 92. That's a long time to be working in, in an app yeah. that, that has grown to be such an incredibly extraordinary instrument for developing your personality visually. So I'm grateful to Photoshop. Believe me, it's a, it, it is a masterful uh, method. And, and, there, and there are other uh, image processors, too, that are quite uh, on one, I think, is very beautiful in many, in many special ways. And I use it periodically. You know, one of the um, most interesting things about you and your work is that you're constantly evolving. And I really love that. It's one of the reasons why I'm always inspired by so much of, 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 the, of the work. And it's been interesting okay. to see how you transition in different phases of your, your career. And one of them that uh, was really fascinating was when you were working on the street and you realized that because you had been inspired by Robert Frank and Henri Kutcher Besson, that for the longest time you had been looking for the moment, right? That that, that, that was the, the anchor sure. up in which you would create the image. And then at some point you sort of pulled back and weren't so much looking for a singular singular moment, but were looking for sort of a synergy of, of, of interplay. And you wrote something really interesting in your book that I want to that I want to read here, and I'd like to sort of discuss this with you further because uh, I, I, this is the first time I'd heard you or anyone else sort of quantify it in this way. And it says, after a while, I found that I wasn't stopping because my eye had caught some object, but because I myself was caught in the web of forces that cities project as an integral part of their structure, forces that seem invisible, but that nonetheless exert a pressure. And for me, that was like revelatory. It was just like, oh, I, I know that. I know that feeling. But mm. to see you quantify it and to, and to use that as the launching pad for you to create images, I found completely fascinating. So I really would love for you to expand on that a little bit. You know, we are... We are more than just identifiers of an object or a gesture in space. Uh, those are signifiers, let's say. You know, someone steps off the curb and, and lurches their hand in the air to hail a taxi, and for a second, they become mythic. They look like they're a, uh, you know, a javelin thrower or, or, or a discus thrower. You know, they have a kind of um, athletic grace. From, and we've seen people capture momentary gestures or, or, or relationships on the street. And they're beautiful. I, I wouldn't pass one up. But truly, city life is layered with so many complexities and so many unexpected, simultaneous interrelationships that are visible scrolling toward us on the street as our eye roves across the space in front of us, left to right, right to left, up and down. We're seeing the sunlight glinting off buildings and the flag is waving and the tree is blowing and the traffic is going by and the skirt is being lifted by the breeze and the baby's waving in the carriage and the two people are kissing and the guy is saying goodbye. It's all happening right in front of us. And we feel the ballet of the street if we can. And that's the thing. It's about opening up our acceptance of, of what we see in front of us. We could narrow it down and look only for the gesture or the detail. Or we could open it up and see how much multiplicity is out there. Because really, street life in any moment in history is about the look and feel of the place with all of its multiplicity. And I felt that I had advanced far enough in my way of photographing that it was time to give up something that I knew how to do well. It's like in any sport, you get to a plateau, and if you want to go further, you got to push yourself. If you're a cyclist and you're doing your 50 miles a day and everything, if you want to get better for that 100-mile race, you got to do 60 the next, the next day. you got to push yourself so that your heart and your legs and your lungs are, are able to go the next step. you got to break yourself open. And that's what I think happened 
to me, I, I, I saw that in order to photograph in color on the street in a fresh, authentic way, I needed to open myself up to the multiplicity of events by stepping back from that seven to 10 foot plane that me and Gary Winogrand used to photograph in because we were street buddies. We were together for years on the street every single day. And at some point, you know, working in color and then Gary left New York, I was pretty much on my own and, and I was trying to develop my own voice and vocabulary. And it meant letting go of that incident and expanding. So I was learning to see and describe all these simultaneous events. And at first, the pictures looked like shit, really. I mean, you know, they just were chaos. Mm -hmm. and, and I had a hard time myself accepting them. But I knew I had to keep making them because it was a learning experience. Giving up the gesture and the incident required opening myself up to seeing what else could be telling how many things can I see at the same time and make it interesting? Because for the first thing for me, and I used to be for Gary and Todd Papa George, that with the three of us often talked about photography. We were learning the language in the, in the 60s. And, and we often said, yeah, that's interesting when we saw each other's picture. Because if it wasn't interesting, then you didn't say anything. <laughs> it was just another picture that went no place. But if it was interesting, it meant that it was a provocation. Something about the timing and the placement and the layering was getting my interest. I could see that photography was being expanded a little bit. Because that's really what's at the heart of the game is can you not just make a good photograph but can you push through that and make a photograph that has a new degree of photographic intelligence can you make it more complex can you see something in a way that you haven't seen it before even though you've been on the street for all these years so you know, I mean, I know that's a little vague, but really, that's what life is. Life is just pouring itself in the funnel of your existence, you know, and you're just seeing it, you know, pass by you all the time. And you're trying to make some sense out of this flow and your role in it. Hey, I'm going to be teaching two photography workshops in the coming months. In each two-day workshop, I walk you through my own process for seeing, evaluating a scene, and how I use those same principles to cull and edit images in Lightroom. Each day ends with in-depth critiques of the images produced by each student and provides a great way to jumpstart your photography. The first workshop is being offered through the Los Angeles Center of Photography and will be held on May 5th and 6th. The second workshop will be held as part of Street Photo San Francisco on June 9th and 10th, which is part of a week-long dedication to street photography. Find out more and sign up by clicking on the links in the show notes or visit the Candid Frame website. Yeah, the, the quote that I read was related to um, the work that you did in St. Louis and your Empire series. And in those images, uh, as you just said, you weren't looking for that, that telling gesture. You were allowing sort of the space itself to speak to you in some way. And I think that has probably inevitably informed the, the work that you're doing with, with the still lives. Um, but talk to me it, about... Yeah, interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, talk to you about... Yeah, and I'm really sort of curious in terms of trusting yourself to discover a new vocabulary because like you just said when you cast off something that you know has worked for you you start delving into a place that is unknown territory where you're taking risks you're failing it's not gelling in 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 the way that you're probably normally accustomed to and talk to me about that that journey because you've recreated that that experience for yourself over and over again throughout your career. But talk to me about sort of 
you know, the experience of pushing yourself, of, of, you know, forcing yourself to experience that what can be lengthy discomfort as you try to rediscover a way of seeing. Well, let me, let me, I'll, I'll pick up your clue about St. Louis. You know, I went to St. Louis and because uh, I had they, the museum in St. Louis, the director offered me a commission to photograph St. Louis. And after visiting it with, with Colin Westerbeck, actually, I realized that the arch along the river stood in a kind of Mount Fuji-like relationship to the city of St. Louis, which was an old American city in decay. They were gutting the downtown section in the 70s, and they were moving out to the suburbs with malls and stuff like that. Typical American story. <clears throat> and so I wanted to work in St. Louis, which was fair. It had a great a physical drama. It's a small enough city I could walk around it easily. But it had some interesting physical drama, too. And, and, you know, I was looking for the arch scene in the buildings, between the buildings and along the river. And then one day I was walking down the street and something happened. And, and this was like the very first time it ever happened to me. And it's the turning point. I suddenly was on the street and, and I, I swear I felt as if there was a hand lightly placed on my chest. And I couldn't go forward. And, and I thought, what? what? What's going on here? And I, I stopped, you know, I'm carrying like 35 pounds of equipment. I got this big 8x10 camera on my shoulder and a bag of 10 holders, which are very heavy with 20 shots of film. And anyway, I stood there and, and I'm looking around and I'm thinking, why do I have the feeling I have to stop right here? I don't, I don't, usually it's something that would say to me, Oh, that's an interesting combination. Look, Lynn, I'll put the camera here and I'll make that picture. But this was as if a force field had arisen, like a barrier. And I had walked into that force field and it, it wouldn't let me go forward. So I did a crazy thing. I put the camera down right where I couldn't go forward. And I, 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 I looked over the camera and I thought, what is here? What is here? And then... I started to feel, oh, the quality of the light on those buildings and the dark shadows over here and the scale of the people on the streets and the way that, um, you know, street was cutting off on a, on a crazy angle. And suddenly the place appeared, the picture appeared out of nowhere. And I put the the dark cloth over my head and I went under the camera and I focused and I moved just a little bit. You know, the camera rotated slightly and there it was. It was invisible beforehand except through the agency of a kind of like, um, you know, like you enter a zone that goes like that. And, and that was it. I had entered a zone, and there it was. And I thought, is that possible? Can you literally walk around and wait till you feel your skin, um, like goosebumps on your skin? You know how sometimes you enter a place and you get a chill of like mm -hmm. awareness, yeah. like, ooh, this is, a, this is a strange feeling. I don't know if I want to be here or not, right? I mean, it's like mystery or threatening or happy. Anyway, I decided to open myself to that harmonic, because that's what it is. If we have our own human vibration and we meet another space and we feel that, we create what Steve Reich, the musician, you know Steve Reich? Yeah, yeah, I think he's. So. he's He's a famous American musician from basically in the 60s also. He and Phil Glass created new music in the 60s. And, and, and Steve Reich once said, it's the third voice. You and the sounds you're making, you know, the instruments you're using to create a third voice, a tone. And I wanted to see if the third voice was possible as a vibration between me and the place that I am and the two places harmonizing in such a way that 
an unexpected image is in that force field. <clears throat> I'm not trying to be mystical here. It's practical because you're out walking around and your senses are sort of absorbing everything around you. But it's not only your eye. It's the quality of the air. It's the smells of the pavement and sunlight and and the and the sugar wafting out of the bakery and the bus fumes and the smell of salt in the river and whatever it is, suddenly you feel like, oh, here feels good to me. What can I make of this? Now, I know that's sort of intangible. And probably a lot of your listeners are saying, this guy's a little bit weird <laughs> to me right now. He's off the mark. But And I may well be, but it allowed me to make a lot of photographs and, and to um, respond to people that I passed whose, whose anima, whose spirit gave off a call to me to stop them and make their portrait. And so I think we need to use all of our senses. Well, let's say, no, I'll take that back. We don't need to do anything. But if we are fully, a fully sensed being, six senses, let's say, and some of them are operating at a high level and you blend them together, you may start to make photographs that are much more about all of you and your identity. And, and one of the things that I have been so gratified by in my life as a photographer is so many people have said to me about my work, oh, not like, oh, that's a good photograph, but that, you know, when I looked at that photograph, I felt like I stepped into the space and I was there. Now, that, to me, is a transference of a very special quality. If you can make a photograph that you put up and other people Enter the photographic space, not just with their eye and say, oh, that's a nice composition. I mean, who gives a shit about a composition? Anybody can make composition. But if you can present an experience, a space, a sensual moment, and other people put it on, then photography is alive. Mm -hmm. And I'm willing to risk making pictures that can transcend that thing of being just a flat two-dimensional object and can be an entrance into a sensual experience being shared people far apart through the agency of the photograph. To me, that's a bigger thing. And, and when it works for each of us individually, with an, because I've had it, I've entered, I've walked around in Cartier-Bresson's photographs, I've walked around in, in Atchez, but I've been in the 19th century walking around in an Atchez photo. I've walked in the Luigi Geary space, you know? I, I have experienced um, the transformation that some of these great photographers have offered me. And so I think if I can feel that, why shouldn't other people? All you got to do is try to make a picture that is that spacious in terms of where you can go with it. One of the chapters that you include in your book that I really enjoyed was the story of how you met your wife. Could you briefly recount that for, for our listeners? Well, I, no, first of all, I want to ask you yeah. this question. You know, this was a risk for me because in a way these pictures aren't, quote, Art. And a lot of photographers wouldn't put in pictures like this because it, in a way they're, they're like too intimate, personal. They're not, they don't rise up to that level of, of art. But, you know, living with Maggie, I met Maggie in 1990 and you know, we fell in love. And in the course of our 28 years together now, so much has happened to me that I felt I wanted to try to put into this retrospective book of, um, an expression of what it's like for a mature guy to fall in love with a, a woman and whose life then goes on and she's a part of it. And, and I wanted to celebrate that and, and, and put it in the book regardless of how artful or 
family it was. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and because I didn't want to differentiate. I wanted to say life is life. And these are the pictures I made of a woman who I've really come to love and to understand and who's given me a chance to see myself in a new way. And this is who she who she is in, in, a, in basically eight pages. <laughs> and I, um, it's, it really excited me to do that. And, you know, when I asked the publisher, I said, are, are you guys, are you going to be comfortable with this? And they said, oh, it's too. <laughs> we, we love that you want to do that. It's such an intimate thing. And, and, you know, this is your, it's your autobiography. And this is happening to you. And of course you should put it in. And Lawrence King, by the way, is a wonderful publisher. And they're, they're the publisher that's going to replace Fiden, which had been my publisher. And they had done that retrospective book. But new people bought Fiden. And really, my way of looking at it, they're ruining what was a wonderful brand that was one of the greatest art book publishers in the world. They seem to be making cookbooks now. <laughs> and, and, and from my way of looking at it, they've just, you know, torn the brand down rather than expressing its greatness. But Lawrence King is picking up in a way, in a very courageous way. They have a bunch of, of young editors who are so smart and adventurous, and they're making exciting, challenging books. And, and they gave me the freedom to do that in this book. And I, I really celebrate that. Well, I, I want to get back to my question, but I will tell you that I'm glad you put that in there because it's, I, all your photographs are about you. You know, I have, I've experienced your life and the way that you enjoy life and the way you discover life through your photographs. For me, they're not just um, an aesthetic experience where I'm looking, oh, he makes really nice photographs. It goes beyond that for me. What I've always have learned and continue learning from you is about the importance of being present in my own life and using the camera as the means to not only capture that in a, in a photograph, but to be in the moment. And so when you include that in, in your book, your relationship with her, that makes perfect sense because it's, it's, it's completely in line with everything that you've, you've ever done with your photography. Thank, thanks for saying that, Baron. It's, it's, it, really, photography is about being in the moment, right? It, it uses only a moment <laughs> and recognizes that. And, and it, it stimulates us to consider all the other ways that are momentous. Think about that. In the moment and momentous. The littlest moment and the biggest things in our life are both have moment in them. And, and truly our relationships and the intimacy of our relationships are a great part of it. And you don't always see a lot of that in photographers' work. Here and there we have. Robert Frank made incredible pictures about Mary. Elliot made, Elliot Irwin made pictures about his wife. Uh, um, um, Harry Callahan did some incredibly tender and beautiful photographs about uh, Eleanor. I think there are people who who reach out and and do that, and you know they've been models for me too. And and you know I'm about I I, I shouldn't really talk about this because I've just started uh, putting together something. No, I, I you know what I'll save this for some other time. I would like to talk about. It. I don't know if you plan to or not, but uh, this Masters of Photography. Yeah, course I, I will. I will talk on that, but I, I don't want to leave right. this point right here because for me this okay. was really interesting because I've read so much about your work, I've listened to interviews, I've watched concert videos, and then I, I in this part with about your wife. I learned something new about you, which really surprised me. What was that? And y- y- you were telling the story about how you were in Provincetown. You got on the bike, you know, to get out, get some fresh air, and you see this woman, you know, out of the corner of your eye, but you keep riding. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right? But then you're coming back, and then you see her again, and then you stop and you talk to her, and that's how your relationship began. And then you write in, in the book that you sort of surprise yourself because you're normally not that impulsive. And I went, really? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I look at everything you do and it's like, he's always impulsive. He's always, <laughs> got, 
<laughs> he's always got this feeling and he's always answering the call. And yet when it came to this, all of a sudden he feels like it's a 180 thing. So I was kind of like, okay, I, I definitely oh, got to talk to you about me. this. <laughs> <laughs> you got me, Alex. You really got me. It's true. I, I am impulsive. When I, when I make photographs, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm alert to these things and I, I don't resist. I, I immediately respond, but making photographs and talking to strangers is a very different thing. And, and, um, you know, getting off my bike to speak to a beautiful woman, you know, that takes a different kind of courage because I'm not taking a picture. I, 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 I couldn't pass her by because so many things in that afternoon so many little steps of chance were what brought me together. If, remember I say at the beginning of that little paragraph that I step out at the gate and I think, do I go right on my bike? Mm -hmm, right. Or do I go? I had been writing text for um, Bystander, the history of street photography. That's how long ago this was in 1990. And I had worked all day and I needed to go for like a 10 or 12 mile bike ride. <laughs> and it was late in the day. And so I had to make a decision. Do I go straight out to the highway or do I ride through town, which was sort of closing down after the summer? And my impulse said, go through town. And then on that impulse on the way out, I saw her on the, on the road heading into the sunlight, to the sunset. And then I, I was supposed to go back on the highway to my house because I had already bought stuff for dinner. But it was now so late, the day had gotten late, that I circled back to go into town the other way and stop off at a friend's restaurant for dinner and have her make dinner for me. So I went, you know, on impulse, opposite how I was supposed to go, and then I went opposite how I was thought I was gonna go on the way back, and in both cases, I met the same woman. And that's when I, I just had to get off the bike. Mm -hmm. And in the next hour or so that we spent together, the way we spoke and the exchange of information in our lives in the oncoming darkness of, of a fall day, September 24th, you know, late in the season, by candlelight, something happened between us. And it wasn't about a come on or, you know, we were too who just were curious about each other. And so I invited her to go for a walk the next day and, and we, to a place where I would often meditate out in the sand dunes alongside of a beach where I would often go for a swim after a meditation. And she meditated too. So we, we, we met up and we went, we went out and, and we each had a dream that night. And she told me her dream and I had had the same dream as she had, and it was about the two of us making a meal together, chopping vegetables at a, at a little wooden island in my kitchen, and she had had the same dream as me. And so like when we shared that, it, it, it put us even closer together. And so we spent a week together just getting to know each other, and it wasn't about making love or anything, it was just getting closer to each other until finally we were together and we've been together ever since. Okay. And that's one of those things that, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> well, you, it's life. It, it's life. It's wonderful. Yeah. And, and you include her in what you were just mentioning, the masters of photography, uh, lecture or a pre a workshop series, master class. Uh, that, that you were kind yeah. enough to send me a link to. And I, I want to get into the masterclass, but there was something really interesting because both of you sat down for a part of a conversation that you had. And she talked about, because she's a writer, and she, she spoke about how, you know, your photography and observing your process has influenced her as a writer. And I wanted to put the question to you of how her experience as a writer may have influenced or, or touched your photography. Well, you know, we become a collaborative pair, and um, Maggie's Maggie's um, mastery of language, um, being English by birth, and being a very expressive person who was 
has had many careers in her life. She was a professional dancer, you know, both ballet and modern. She was a musician. She was in a band. She sang. She's been, uh, she wrote a play, a one woman play and performed it off Broadway. She's, she's had a lot. She's been a painter for years. She was a graphic artist and sold, you know, hundreds of paintings in galleries. And she's had a really expressive life. But living with someone who uses words and the economy of words um, has really taught me about tearing down. Because I'm a talker, as, as you know, and, and I like to talk. And language is, is, is delicious for me because I can, in the moment, express things. But it's very different to write and to crystallize your thoughts in writing and to select the words on the page and shape them because you have a chance then to revisit your thoughts and polish them up and expand them. And, and so listening to Maggie, who reads to me regularly, she's in the midst of a novel now, which is so contemporary an issue. It's an angry woman pissed off about everything right now. And the persona she's taken is a failed writer who can't get her book published, you know, and she's just pissed off at, at the publishing world, at the men in it, you know, and how they treat women. And, everything. and boy, is it, and she started this about eight months ago, you know, and, and now this movement the women's movement now of, you know, really women who are speaking out. It's a perfect moment. But listening to Maggie read to me and the way she polishes, you know, chapter after chapter has really taught me how to reconsider my own thinking and has extended and expanded my thinking. So living with a writer has made me... Um, I think more careful in my use of language when I write. I have greater respect for it. it it's not like blurting out. Because when I speak, I, I'm sort of like a jazz musician. I riff on an idea and I take it someplace. But, but you know, maybe it could be said better than I actually express it at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about the Masters of Photography uh, series of which you were um, one of the photographers. How did that come come about? How were you approached about it? And what and what appealed to you about the idea? There's uh, the founder named Chris Ryan, who himself is a first rate um, commercial advertising photographer in London that's been doing food photography for more than 35 years. He's at the top of his game. And some years ago, a bunch of friends of his, um, more or less editorial or uh, stock photographers, were talking about having you know, how the internet has crushed their kind of photography and how they needed to do something about it. And Chris helped them and established a stock website. And he then built it in such a way that able to expand it on 60 platforms worldwide. And these guys are now making a fortune every year. And, and Chris realized that with the, with the ascension of the smartphone, there are over a million people on the planet now equipped with a smartphone. And they're all taking pictures. And out of that billion, hundreds of millions have discovered photography and they want to make a better picture. And then this is the moment to launch a Masters of Photography website that helps people to improve their photography, like their tennis game, their golfing, or their cooking skills. I said, Knowing now about these platforms and how to establish it, he's going to make the best of photography. And he came to me oh, a year and five months ago, in November of 16, he came to me in Paris and he showed me his presentation and he said, I want you to be the first master of photography because I've seen your your you know, uh, interviews on on Fiden and on the web and all that, and I think you could do it. 
And I had already developed a 35 lesson that I was going to publish as a book. And the publisher I, I, I wanted to do it, who wanted to do it with me, then backed off. They didn't know how to market it. And Chris got it right away. And so we spent last year filming. We filmed in New York and London. We filmed with students. We filmed on location. We went to Tuscany and, and Siena. We worked on the street. We, we really did a lot of work. <laughs> and then produced this five and a half hours and carefully edited it and whittled it down. And I think it really offers a wide range of um, openings. Someone who wants to have courage to work on the street, they can see me working, just like I saw Cartier-Bresson in 1963, shooting on the streets of Manhattan at a parade when I was with Tony Ray Jones. The two of us watched Cartier-Bresson dodge and weave and bob and move through a crowd, and we thought, oh my God, that's how you do it. Just like I saw Robert Frank move. And so I think people learn very quickly by observing somebody do it rather than just tell you how to do it. And so I did landscapes and portraits and, um, you know, I show people how to organize your photographs, how to edit them, maybe how to lay out a book, how to work with a subject so that you can actually create a body of work, how to have you know, a, a, a partner to have a collaboration with. I think there are a lot of things that I, I'm a generalist in, in that sense. The next work is Steve McCurry. And Steve McCurry is a remarkable photographer, National Geo, can make assignments come to life, knows how to be in countries and work in certain kinds of situations. Like, and Albert Watson is a remarkable portraitist who knows how to get people to give themselves up. They're specialists, you know, and, and I think I'm sort of more of a generalist in that I've had 55 years of trying all kinds of things from architecture to street photography to portraits to landscape. So, <clears throat> you know, not everybody wants to be an artist. There are more people probably want to be professionals so they could make a living. And I think Albert and, and, and Steve are going to be great at helping people to find their way as uh, specialists. Oh, it's, it's and maybe there are people who want to be and and maybe I'll be useful to them. Well, it's a beautiful sorry, series. I mean, it's just like, it, you, I learned so much from it, but I also really appreciated the, the cinematography, the editing on it. It's really fantastic. But I have to say, the, the moment that most impressed me was when I think you were, I think you were in Siena and you see some guy, shirtless guy, with, with a ladder, and then... You got 30 years on me and you're, you, you just bolt. <laughs> you just start running towards this guy. And I'm going, man, I can only hope that I'm in my, my 80s that I'm ready to run after a shot like you were. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it was so perfect, wasn't it? It was just it was great. great. I, I'm talking to the camera and this guy pops out with a ladder out of a, a little tiny door. And he's in shorts. And, and I say, I say, come on, you know, watch this, watch this, look at this. And I'm running and the guys are running with me and I'm talking to the audience, basically to all my people who are going to be taking the course and saying, don't wait, don't hesitate. You just run. And, and of course, I had to interact with the guy because I, I called out because I had to make the lesson. But the guy was so natural. He just turned and he just was there. And the picture is a kind of charming picture. And of course, you know, one could work that. But I, for making the lesson, it was important to just show that you could close the gap in a matter of 10 seconds and, and uh, something, something calls to you, you respond to it, you make the picture and it's gone. Yeah. And, and that's how you build a body of work. And I really, that's the lesson to me in that, in that picture is that you're always in the process of discovering. And, and yeah, sure, for most of my life, I never spoke to a person on the street and I never manipulated or touched anything because my belief was the street gives and you receive. 
It wasn't about touching and, and arranging anything. It was about the found moment. That's what I learned from Cartier Bresson. That's what I learned from Robert Frank. That's what, that's what we believed in the 60s. Other people now show us that you can manage, you can stage manage if you want. We're living in an era where people set things up all the time. My generation didn't do that. We believed that our perception was where the art was, that we could perceive in a fraction of a second the momentous arrival of something that had meaning for us. These uh, 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 alternative things happening at the same time, we could put a frame around them, and that frame held the content. We invented that frame. We invented it. Mm. The, the, the subject in a way it wasn't about staging reality which lots of people do now and, and you know that's conceptual photography and it's a legitimate act you know if you can think these things up and act on them fine but you know we couldn't and we didn't dare and touch things so I, anyway but I, I think it's important to be able to share this kind of enthusiasm and the unexpected beauties of life with people. And I'm hoping that the, uh, the workshop helps people. You know, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's there for that first. Yeah. If it becomes successful, you know, great. That would be even lovely, too. It might, you know, help me to live a little bit <laughs> more. Well, my last question uh, that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore on their own, and it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll I mean, I have, I'm very fortunate, I feel, to know lots of young photographers people who've either sought me out or whose work I've discovered and I've really treasured. But I was just at my birthday in, in Berlin. A lot of young friends of mine arrived and I saw a new book in progress by um, Gus Powell. Hmm. And you can look up Gus Powell. He's got a couple of books out there, but he's just making a new book. And I mean, I could really, I, I could name three or four all, all at once right now. And I, I don't like to, uh, you know, lose some of them because they're so important. Um, but Gus has, is gelling, you know, he's like nearing 40. And I've known him since 1994. And I've watched him grow and he's really, he's deepening and he's poetic and he's risky and he's funny and he can express himself, you know. Uh, Jonathan Smith and Rob Stevenson and Ben Ingham and Matt Stewart and, uh, I mean, there's, there are there are people out there who are who are playing interesting tunes right now and making, I think, remarkable pictures. And they, they maintain what I think of as old standards, high photographic standards. They're, they're risky, but they're not, you know, only um, conceptual. They're, they're holding on to the past and they're bringing it into the present in challenging ways that move me. I think that's the the important factor for me. It's not just eye candy for a moment, but it's people who are making interesting, demanding photographs. And, and I'll tell you, wait a second. I, I want to name, I'm just throwing this on the table, okay? okay? Because women women are involved in this too. There's Melanie Einzig. And there's Kate Kirkwood, and there's Missy O'Shaughnessy, Melissa O'Shaughnessy, people who are are um, out there on the streets or in the countryside, working in ways that really, when I see their work, I I stop for a moment and I think, yeah, you know, they got these are these are tough, thoughtful, provocative people. And it's encouraging. That's all. I just feel very encouraged that photography is 
is uh, not just a trend, but is, is still a deep and beautiful medium. Well, Joel, thank you so much for your time and for, for your work. I can't, I can't thank you enough. Ibarri and Lexi, it's always an incredible pleasure speaking with you, Anna. And I'm sorry that I'm so far away. I would love to just give you a hug. Oh, you thank you. Man. Nearby <laughs> like that time we were in, in, in L.A. And that I can still see us in that hotel. Oh, yeah. In a bar in the back there talking for a, an hour or so. Thanks to Joel for sharing his time and story. If you want to order his book, please consider using the Amazon affiliate link in the show notes. We receive a small percentage of the sale and it helps us here at TCF. You'll also find a link to the Masters of Photography online series, which I really think is worthy of your attention. And you can show your support of the Candid Frame by writing a review in the iTunes store. As people search for podcasts to listen to, these reviews lead people to listen to us for the very first time, and that can make all the difference. So if you haven't already, please take the time to do it today. Thanks to Net888GP from Italy for his review. You can also support the show by making a monthly contribution through Patreon. And for as little as $2 a month, you can help us to not only meet the cost of production, but also allow us to improve the podcast, YouTube channel, and website. Or if you just want to make a one-time contribution to the show, you can do so via PayPal. You'll find links for both on the Candor Frame website or the show notes. Thanks to Sandra Reed, Borgia, and Thierry Hua for their recent contributions. It means a lot to us. To access our complete archive of interviews, download the free Candid Frame app, available for Apple iOS and Android. Not only will you immediately receive the latest episode on your phone or tablet, but you can easily share your favorite episodes on your social networks and help spread the word. And if you want to drop me a line with comments or suggestions for the show, you can email me directly from the app. Download it today by clicking on the show notes on the website at thecandidframe.com. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at simply at IbarianX. And this is IbarianX, and this is The Candid Frame. <laughs>